From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. There is one big story for Bloomberg audiences today, and that, of course, is the Federal Reserve and what it is likely to do in Washington. So we've st sent our best and brightest down to cover it. He's Michael McKee. So, Mike, you're down there to cover this. What are we expecting? Well, David, the question is, how does Jay Powell get around the question of will the Fed speed up interest rates uh, increases? We're already going to see that today with 50 basis points baked in. But the question becomes, do they go faster? You take a look at where they expect to be, which is neutral, and the market now sees that at over 3 percent by the end of the year. Well, the white line is where we would be at the end of the day. That's uh, more than 200 basis points away. So to get to the terminal rate by the end of the year, or or at least to get to neutral, the Fed would have to do maybe some 75 basis point moves. So those are the questions for today. Do we see the Fed do 75 basis points? Probably not today, but do they hint at doing it in the future? And then the statement is probably going to emphasize the fact that there are going to be additional rate increases Then the news conference with Jay Powell saying, do we uh, think that uh, you're going to raise rates 75 basis points? We'll see how he dodges that. We also get the news on the balance sheet and how they're going to proceed with that. Uh, that probably won't have as much market impact as the question of uh, where the Fed is going and how fast. And we will begin to get some of those answers at 2 o'clock today with the statement. And then, of course, that news conference, as I said, all in a special. And Mike McKee will be back right here, coming from Washington to bring it all to us. Thanks so much, Mike, for being with us today. And now, in the meantime, in advance of that Fed decision today, J.P. Morgan Chair and CEO Jamie Bl Giant Diamond talked with our colleague Francine Lacqua about the job in front of Chair Powell today. And the Fed is going to have to raise rates and reverse QE. And they're going to, you know, if they can, they're going to try to slow down the economy enough so that 8 percent starts to come down over time. And I wish them the best. Yeah. You know, we're a little late, but, you know, remember two years ago we had 15 percent unemployment and no vaccine. So I think people should take a deep breath, give them a chance, and I think they're going to move. I think the sooner they move, the better. Uh, so, yeah, they're going to be raising rates. Deep breath, but what could go wrong? Though? I mean, you talk about, you know, strong U.S. consumer, strong business. You talked also about storm clouds. What are those storm crowd, clouds? Well, the, and what's worst case scenario right yeah, now? Yeah, I, I hate the word unprecedented, but there's kind of fiscal and monetary induced unbelievable growth in the U.S., which was true around the world, though it's obviously slowing down in Europe. That's abnormal. We've never really quite had that before. We've never had QT before. So, you know, you look at QE, that's one of the greatest experiments ever done. They're going to be writing books for 50 years on it, and we're going to have to reverse it. And that's a huge change in the flow of funds over time around bonds and rates and stuff like that. My own view is that rates are probably, will still have to go up uh, from here. That, of course, is Jamie Dimon, the chair and CEO of J.P. Morgan, speaking earlier today to Bloomberg. Now we're going to turn to one of the consistently best economy predictors that we, as we rate them here at Bloomberg. He's Stephen Stanley. He's the chief economist at Amherst Pierpont Securities. It is now a Santander company. So, Stephen, congratulations, first of all, on your new, uh, and your new uh, relationship. But uh, give us your sense of what you're expecting out of the Fed today. Yeah, I think Chairman Powell has a tough job ahead of him because, as, as Mike outlined, uh, the markets have really gotten pretty aggressive about their expectations uh, of future rate hikes. Um, and I'm not sure the Fed is, is inclined at this point to quite match what the market has priced in. But at the same time, having uh, been so slow to the game and really blowing it, really, you know, to be blunt on inflation, uh, Chairman Powell has to be tough uh, and he has to be consistently tough. Uh, and I think we'll see that tone again today, uh, as we have over the last several appearances that he's made. Stephen, you point to a really interesting point, I wonder. Uh, if there's an error to, error to be made here, does he need to err on the side of hawkishness rather than dovishness, given the fact that he may have lost a bit of credibility on the inflation question? Absolutely. I think the Fed is, is struggling at this point to regain that credibility. Um, and it feels like the markets have kind of taken control of the narrative. I, I, I feel like the markets kind of pushed uh, the Fed into going uh, so aggressively at this meeting, this uh, doing not only 50 basis points, but also uh, balance sheet reduction at the same time. And now, as Mike said, a lot of people are thinking in terms of maybe the Fed having to go 75 at the next meeting. So uh, the Fed is kind of um, 
chasing events a little bit at this point, and uh, Chairman Powell will hopefully try to wrest control of that narrative back today in his press conference. And what effect is this all likely to have on the economy? Where are we? I, I've seen in your most recent notes that we're still pretty good in terms of business and consumer spending. Yeah, I think the economy still has a lot of momentum in the short run. We're, we're, you know, we're hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence of very strong consumer spending. Uh, I think households are, are still getting back to what we would think of as normal, you know, fully reopened, um, uh, you know, fully reopened activity, uh, travel, and things like that. So um, it, it's very much going to be, uh, I think, strong growth for the next few quarters. And, you know, eventually, Tighter Fed policy means potentially tougher um, conditions and, and possibly even a slowdown or a recession. But uh, we're, you know, we're pretty far away from that. That's probably two years out or maybe even more. So, so Stephen, you suggested perhaps to some extent uh, Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed right now, is chasing the markets with respect to the bond markets. Is he also chasing the labor market? Is he also chasing the, the housing market, which seem to be going ahead as well? And that is an inflation problem, potentially. Yeah, I think housing is actually going to be a nice test case uh, of this because mortgage rates obviously have risen, um, you know, much faster than what we're going to see for a lot of other borrowing rates. So if housing sustains its strength through the next, you know, six months into the latter part of 2022, that's going to be a good sign for the economy, I think, and tell you that the economy can withstand higher rates. Um, you know, and in contrast, if housing starts to slow down rapidly, uh, later this year, then I think you're going to have a, a verdict on just how sensitive the economy is to rates. In the meantime, as you again pointed out in one of your notes, we're almost to two job openings for every person without a job. So where are we with the labor economy? We have the dual ma mandate. Obviously, Chair Powell right now is very clearly focused on inflation. D does he not have to worry at all about the employment side? Well, the two are very much linked, I think, at this point. The labor market is so tight, it's red hot. And as a result, you're seeing, you know, ongoing strong wage gains. And that is going to continue to feed into the inflation picture. Uh, he certainly doesn't have to worry about uh, employment in the sense of, of having to be easier to get uh, the labor market into health. We're in full health right now. I think the unemployment rate is probably going to continue to fall over the course of the year. We might even see uh, below 3% on the unemployment rate by next year. And where are you right now, Stephen, on the prospect of recession? We ask everybody that question. By and large, we hear a lot of probably not this year, but maybe next. Yeah, I think it's I would say it's it's a certainly a real possibility um, if the Fed has to get really aggressive. And I fear that is the risk that the Fed ends up having to go uh, much more than than what is currently priced in ultimately uh, to get inflation under control. But I think it's going to take a while for that to, to do its, um, you know, have its full effect on the economy. So if we're going to have a recession, I I'm thinking it's probably latter half of 2024, maybe even 2025. Stephen, finally, as you suggest, we feel like we know an awful lot about what's going to be said today, uh, both with respect to the rates and also, for that matter, with respect to the balance sheet, given the notes from the last meeting. Uh, if we are surprised, where will we likely be surprised? I think it's really going to come down to the tone that Chairman Powell conveys and what the market interprets from that about how fast the Fed's going to go. So, you know, as Mike said, I think the market's like very explicit guidance. So they would love for Chairman Powell to come out and say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z in the next three meetings. And of course, he's not going to say that. Um, but his language is going to be parsed very carefully. Um, and that's, I think, going to determine how the market's responded based on uh, whether he's ruling in or out certain options that he might have at his disposal and what he has to say about how far the Fed might need to go uh, to get inflation under control. Okay, Stephen, it's always so helpful to talk with you. Thank you. That's Stephen Stanley. Be sure to follow our special coverage of the Fed decision on Bloomberg Television and Radio starting today at 2 p.m., 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Beg your pardon. Coming up, we talk with Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee about what happened to that regulation of big tech Washington's been talking about. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. For that, we turn to Ritika Gupta here with the first word. Ritika? Thanks, David. The European Union is proposing to ban Russian crude oil over the next six months. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen also said that refined Russian fuels would be banned by the end of the year. Bloomberg's learned that Hungary and Slovakia won't have to enforce the ban until the end of 2023. Both were opposed to a quick cutoff of Russian oil. Northern Ireland elections on Thursday could mark a major shift in the region's sensitive political balance and undermine UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson's bid to redraw the terms of the UK split from the European Union. Opinion polls show Sinn Féin, whose ultimate goal is to unite the region with the Republic of Ireland on course to become the biggest party. Such an outcome would hold profound significance for Northern Ireland, which has been historically dominated by parties loyal to Britain. And a study from the UK says that severe COVID may cause long-lasting cognitive impairment, equivalent to losing about 10 IQ points. Patients were assessed six to 10 months after being hospitalized. They showed slower and less accurate responses than what was expected. The study says it was similar to how much brain power 70-year-olds typically have lost compared to those age 50. And the White House is boosting support for quantum computing as China pours billions into the next generation technology. President Biden is signing a couple of tech-focused directives today. One would require the country's most vulnerable IT systems to adopt new standards against the threat of code cracking from quantum computers. Federal agencies will also help to develop comprehensive plans to safeguard America's intellectual property. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Ritika. Well, we've had new news about regulation of big tech, but it's on the other side of the Atlantic over in Brussels as the European Union has moved forward with two different acts to really address big tech issues. In the meantime, back in the United States, we haven't heard as much recently, but we are joined now by somebody who really knows this area terribly well. She is Senator Marsha Blackburn, Republican of Tennessee. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. I want to talk about big tech with you, as I always do. But first, just spend a minute or two with us on that leaked decision or opinion coming out of the Supreme Court. You've tweeted about it. What do you make of what we saw? Yeah. You know, David, what we saw was an activist inside the court, someone who is working for a justice, obviously. And whether they're from the left or the right, what they did was wrong. They're trying to influence an outcome. Uh, the justices spend a lot of time in conversation, in uh, sending drafts back and forth, in editing. As they reach their opinions, confidentiality is paramount. To do this is a violation of that trust that has been placed in that individual. Um, I, I'm pleased that Chief Justice Roberts is beginning an investigation. The marshals are going to do an investigation, I think, in short order. They will know exactly who did this, and they should be punished to the full extent allowable. Yes, yeah, Senator, actually, I worked up there as a law clerk many years ago, and I can tell you it is shocking, the, the breach of confidence, no question about it. But I wonder if we could yeah. also ask you about the polit political consequences, potentially, uh, of this development. One of the things that uh, Senator Schumer from the Democratic side noted yesterday is so far, uh, the Republicans such as yourself have focused on the leak, not on the merits of it. Do you think that this will be helpful to Republicans if, in fact, and we don't know this will happen, the court comes out the way this opinion would indicate? Yeah, I, I think it would be appropriate at this point to focus on, on what happened to the integrity of the court and then respond appropriately when there is a decision. Uh, whether they uphold or whether they send this back to the states, it's important to note that there would not be anything that banned abortion. It would be positioning it with the states to make the restrictions and regulations on abortion. So, Senator, I do want to turn to the big tech issue because uh, this is something you do know a lot about. You've invested a lot of your personal time and effort in it. We have two new yeah. acts, they're called, uh, coming out of Europe, a Digital Markets Act, a Digital Services Act, uh, to regulate big tech. Thus far, we don't have, I don't believe, any counterpart in the United States. What do you make of what Europe is doing, and should we be doing something similar? Oh, indeed. And Senator Blumenthal and I have worked in a bipartisan manner uh, drafting legislation that would address some of these and holding hearings. You know, we've had five hearings 
on big tech this year and focusing on what is happening online, whether it's to consumers, whether it's to children, looking at what is happening in the Section 230 realm, which, as you mentioned, the Digital Services Act goes after that fraudulent information, fraudulent merchandise. That is more closely akin to our Section 230. Um, when it comes to privacy, that is their Markets Act. And I, I think, David, if you, as I have talked to those parliamentarians from the UK, from the EU, from Canada, but when the EU, when they look at what happened with GDPR, they feel like they overreached and therefore they stifled innovation. So they wanted to do a revisit of that into something that would be more friendly to innovation. And I appreciate the thoughtfulness that they have brought to this. They felt like it was important to move forward. They are ready for us to move forward. I'm ready to move forward with consumer privacy. We have our legislation about ready to go and are looking forward to getting that filed. Of course, our open app market bill is ready to go to the floor for markup. Our kids online safety bill is ready to receive a markup in Commerce Committee. So, Senator, I, you pointed to the question I wanted to get to, which is the balance between promoting innovation and, yes, free speech, such as, such as it is yeah. online, at the same time, protecting people against certain forms of speech. That's something that Elon Musk, as he buys Twitter, he wants to have more open forums, not as much regulation. Do regulations such as the Digital Services Act pot potentially impose some responsibilities on people like Elon Musk to make sure they are policing their speech, at least to some degree? Yes, when you look at their Digital Services Act, what you will see is that these aggregator sites are going to have to confirm that uh, the information they're sending forward is accurate or that the products that they are pushing into the marketplace are not fraudulent products. Uh, this just, it doesn't limit free speech, it doesn't limit change of ideas. Uh, what it does is focus on uh, the, the creator of that content. And I, I think that this is a way for them to keep that uh, open forum, if you will. So, and when I look at what, it, what we do in America, the public square, which you were talking about Twitter and Elon. Now, David, when that started, it was to be the online public square. And this nation and our freedoms have been well served by robust, respectful, bipartisan debate. Getting that point and that counterpoint. We want to make certain that free speech in the USA continues, that people have the right to speak their mind. And we're not going to agree all the time. But I accept that, and I realize that I learn from hearing someone give a counterpoint to a point that I have made. That's a good thing. We want to keep speech free. We want to keep these platforms accessible. And we want to make certain that products that are sold online are not fraudulent products. At, at the same time, as you said, you've got legislation that you're proposing with Senator Blumenthal. What are the prospects of getting that enacted anytime soon? The prospects increase every day. Uh, when you talk to uh, moms, one of the things that they want to see is privacy for their children online, safety for their children online. They also want to make certain that there is a way to protect the privacy of their family and, them, and themselves individually. I call it protecting and owning their virtual you. They want to control that information. And every day that goes by, and certainly COVID contributed to this, what we hear from people is, I want to own my information. And legislation that I've been working on for years would enable you, the consumer, to provide explicit consent if you want to share your information. If you withhold that consent, the platform could not boot you off the platform. 
and they could not make that the price, if you will, for using their platform. Senator, thank you so much. Really appreciate your being with us. That's Senator Marsha Blackburn of Absolutely. Tennessee. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the markets ahead of that Fed decision to about just over 90 minutes from right now. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. As we all know, the Fed is due out in about an hour and 34 minutes from right now with its Fed decision, latest decision on rates and then to be followed by a news conference. And so we're going to take a look at the markets in advance of that. And then we turn to Kriti Gupta. So what are the markets doing, Kriti? Well, the markets are down, David, and this is really strange because t traditionally, at least going back in the last year, every time you've had a Fed meeting, you've had this kind of risk off ramp up. And the day of the Fed meeting, you've seen a little bit of green on the screen. This time around, you see the exact opposite. You've had two days of gains and then some positive uh, or I should say two days of gains and then and some uh, moves down this morning as well. And really, it comes down to uh, if they're, what they're going to say about their dual mandate. Uh, for our TV audience, you're seeing a graphic on your screen about the unemployment versus the inflation. You can see that they've really done that. But a lot of these comments today are going to be about the jobs market. How tight is too tight at a time when you're actually seeing a lot of concern about the jobs market. I believe the statistic out is almost two open jobs for every one unemployed person. So it's really interesting to see that this tightness of the labor market that was really praised uh, pre-pandemic now really called extreme and considered something to address, David. At the same time, Kriti, haven't the markets priced in an awful lot of tightening at this point? Is there a chance that actually they could react with some favor, uh, depending on what Jay Powell says, what the Fed says? I believe, David, they call this job owning. How much has the Fed really prepared the markets for what they're going to hear today? 50 basis points is what's priced into the market for the next, I believe, three meetings for sure. 75 basis points is where it really gets tricky because you do start to see these market calls for 75 basis points. At some point, you even saw some market pricing for that. And the Federal Reserve has already shown, even with the last uh, interest rate hike that it happened, 25 basis points in the last meeting, you really saw the market far, far ahead of it. The Fed had to do some catching up. So if the market is pricing in 75 basis points, will the Fed catch up? And that's really what we're waiting to see. Any comments in that direction or if they completely kind of throw that out of the window that 50 is as big as they're going to go. Okay, thank you so much for setting it up for us. That's Kriti Gupta on the markets ahead of that Fed decision. Coming up, we get the latest on the war in Ukraine with Russia expert Angela Stent of Brookings. That's coming up next, and we are on Bloom Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Now we want to keep up to date with news from around the world. For that, we go to Ritika Gupta here with the first word. Ritika? Thanks, David. Russia is focused on cementing both military and political control over the Ukrainian territory it has taken so far. The Kremlin is installing occupation governments and has ordered locals to use rubles for transactions. Bloomberg's learned there will be also be referendums in some areas to open the way for full annexation. North Korea launched what appeared to be a medium-range ballistic missile today as Kim Jong-un ramps up his nuclear program ahead of President Biden's first visit to Seoul. South Korea said it was still analyzing details of the launch and North Korean state media often don't reveal details of such exercises until at least the next day. Kim's regime is on pace for its busiest testing year ever. Biden is expected to make his first visit to Seoul as president on May 20th. Shanghai and Beijing are sticking to their COVID zero policies no matter what the economic cost is. But Hong Kong is gradually moving towards opening up to the rest of the world. The city is accelerating a plan to ease social distancing rules. Hong Kong's also ending a ban on visits by all non-residents and relaxed some restrictions on inbound flights. And the number of people going hungry surged by 25% last year. And that toll is rising as the war in Ukraine sends food prices even higher. Conflicts in countries like Ethiopia and Afghanistan have worsened crises there. And economic shocks from the COVID-19 pandemic curbed food access in many areas. That's according to new data from the Global 
Network Against Food Crises, which found almost 193 million people across more than 50 countries suffered acute food insecurity in 2021. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Ritika. I want to go back to the story Ritika just told us about, and that is the apparent attempt to annex parts of the eastern uh, Ukraine, particularly around the Donbass region. And we want to turn now for a, a read on what is really going on over there to a true Russia, and for that matter, Vladimir Putin expert. Angela Stent is Brookings Institution's senior fellow, and she is author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the Rest. So, Angela, thank you so much for being with us. What do we know about what's going on in the Donbass region right now? Well, there's fierce fighting going on there as the Russian troops try and take the whole of the Donbass region. They only control some of it now. Uh, but we have heard rumors that it's possible that next week they will announce they've annexed uh, those two separatist entities and they will become part of Russia. Um, that's one of the, the stories we hear. And then we hear that there will be, as, you're, uh, as you were saying before, um, referenda in some of the towns that they've currently taken over nearby, uh, and that those referenda will also have to do with uh, joining Russia or at least becoming a quote-unquote independent people's republic. So they are installing uh, occupation governments and, yes, trying to get people to use the ruble. Now, as I understand, it, Angela, these are areas that, for the most part, uh, Russian forces or Russian uh, sympathizers were occupying already. So this is not because of the war, necessarily. Is this a shift away from trying to take the rest of the Donbass? I don't think it's a shift away. I think what they're trying to do is consolidate their power there. Um, and some of the towns like Kherson, uh, where they are gonna, apparently going to have a referendum, were not um, under Russian occupation before. So I think they're just trying to consolidate everything they can there with the hope, they think, once they've stabilized that, of moving further west um, and taking more territory, uh, which gets them nearer to uh, Moldova. And we already heard a Russian general a couple of weeks ago saying that was one of their ultimate aims, was to get to the separatist region of Transnistria, which is part of Moldova. Angela, we've heard a lot of talk about May 9, which is a holiday in Russia to celebrate their victory over Germany in World War II. How important is that day, and what sort of announcement might we expect out of Vladimir Putin? Clearly, he's not going to be able to announce that he's moved into Kyiv. So it's a very important holiday, and, and particularly under Putin, he's now created this cult of World War II. Um, and so he does need to make a big announcement. Uh, some people think he is going to declare general mobilization and actually say that he declare war on Ukraine. Remember, until now, it's a quote-unquote special military operation. But that would mean general mobilization might incur more popular criticism of this war, because obviously there would be more casualties, but it would also enable him to put the Russian economy on a wartime footing. Um, other people say that he's not going to do that, that he will declare victory of some sort uh, in the Donbass, um, and he might declare, as we were just saying, uh, that those two republics of Luhansk and Donetsk are now part of Russia. So all eyes are on uh, that May 9th parade. We've already seen pictures of them rehearsing for it. All of the new nuclear missiles being paraded there and the troops doing their goose steps. Angela, when we talk about a general mobilization, could that also include a broader draft or conscription of forces? Because there are reports that, in fact, they're going through their troops fairly quickly. There were reports, for example, they had to ship some in from the Far East. Yes, no, no, that definitely would mean general mobilization means a much broader draft. Um, and they've already been using draftees in this uh, military operation. But yes, more people would be conscripted into the army. Uh, also, we heard today uh, plans, first of all, out of the European Union for a, a decline in the purchase of oil from Russia, really uh, shutting it off by the end of the year. At the same time, we heard out of Moscow, boy, that's a two-edged sword, I think was the expression they used. What do you make of that? How much would that affect Russia if, in fact, that came to pass? Well, if they do phase out imports of Russian oil, that's really pretty significant, you know, in terms of the earnings that Russia gets. Um, you know, right now it supplies a, a goodly amount of, of oil to the European Union. Um, and, of course, the Europeans will have to find alternative sources, and that's what they're scrambling to do at the moment. But they appear to be determined uh, to cut off uh, this source of revenue that fuels the Russian war machine.
Which raises the broader question of how many more sanctions can we have? President Biden came out and addressed specifically the economy earlier today, but in the course that he was asked a question about it, this is what he said. We are always open to additional sanctions, and I've been in consultation. I've been speaking with the members of the G7 this week about what we're going to do or not do. So, Angela, of course, he said we're talking with the G7. Uh, most people say it's much more effective if you can get other people to join you in the sanctions. Is there a lot more we can do to Russia? Well, we've just sanctioned another, cut off another major bank, Sparebank, from the SWIFT system. I guess there are more banks that we could be totally cut off from the international payment system. I don't, there aren't a whole lot more sanctions, I think, that can be imposed at this point. Um, and as you alluded to it, a large number of countries, of course, have not joined the sanctions. Hmm. China, India, uh, um, uh, a number of, uh, you know, Latin American countries, Africans, Middle East. So the, the Western sanctions are powerful. Obviously, the countries that have imposed them, you know, have the lion's share of the world's GDP. Uh, but not all countries are going to join those sanctions. And that gives Russia still... Uh, opportunities to trade and get financing. Angela, as I mentioned, you wrote that really terrific book, Putin's World. And so I think if you sort of as somebody who can uh, sort of identify what's going on with President Putin at any given time, what do we know about his state right now? There are reports that he's relatively isolated. There's speculation even about his mental state or his physical state. Do we know anything? I mean, a lot of it's speculation. We certainly can assume that he was informed by those around him. They gave him a false picture of what was going to happen. He apparently really did believe that this would be an easy win over Ukraine. But I think he also seems to be dug in now, uh, determined to finish uh, at least taking part of Ukraine, uh, really resulting at the moment or what could be uh, a Ukraine that's divided uh, between uh, the eastern part that really is with Russia and then the kind of the rest of Ukraine uh, that would have to function without a lot of its economic lifeline. So we don't see any indication at the moment that Putin wants to make any concessions or to withdraw troops. Well, what about that possibility? As I say, I, I read your book and, and I learned a lot about Vladimir Putin. How patient a man is he? Because if, in fact, he takes, for example, let's make it up, the eastern part, so uh, part of the Donbass, or maybe even all the Donbass, but then he has to wait for the rest of it to try to really put more pressure on Kiev and the rest of Ukraine which is, would be supported, I'm assuming, by the United States. Is he patient? That could be a matter of years, and there could be conflict going on in the meantime. I think he's fairly patient, although, you know, he turned 70 in September, so he may be more focused on his legacy now than he would have been 10 years ago. But I, this is a conflict that could go on for a long time. Uh, it could, one phase of it could end, say, uh, you know, in a few weeks or maybe months with the ceasefire and, you know, territorial rearrangements. But then it could resume again, uh, assuming that he's not going to give up on his broader goal of really subjugating Ukraine and creating this Slavic state consisting of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Angela, do we have any good sense of the degree to which he's uh, uh, enjoying support from within Russia? Because uh, there was some thought at the beginning the Russian people would not be very excited about this. You mentioned that if there's a general mobilization, that it might actually be counterproductive because people would be more nervous about it. But then there are reports that, in fact, he's gathering support. Yes, his support levels, if you're to believe, and this is an independent pollster, and, and I do believe them, uh, his support has grown um, as this war has gone on. People seem to believe they're now in a patriotic fight, uh, you know, to save Russia against Western enemies, and that's how he's casting it now. It's not just Russia against Ukraine. It's essentially Russia against NATO and particularly the United States. And so the, he, he seems to have gained in popularity among those people who are still in Russia, obviously. Obviously, a large number of Russians have left. I heard a figure of 600,000 yesterday. I don't know if that's true. Uh, and those people are clearly not supporting him. But of those that are left, um, there seems to still be support for the war and an acceptance that, you know, when the body bags come home, uh, these people's sons and husbands and brothers have died in a noble cause. Uh, Angela, finally, what do we think about Vladimir Putin's plans beyond uh, Ukraine? Originally, there was speculation, at least, in the West that he had thoughts about sort of a greater Russia, reestablishing a former empire that would have included other countries. I mean, he's already moved into northern Georgia, of course, but the Baltics and some other areas. Given what's happened here, is it uh, almost necessary that he's reevaluating that? Because this clearly didn't go as easily as he thought it might have gone. 
Right. And so the Slavic state to which I uh, I just alluded, that would be hard to create now because he doesn't have the whole of Ukraine. We did have the general say that they're interested in linking up with Transnistria. So they may have their eyes on Moldova, uh, for instance, where you have a very pro-Western president at the moment, but someone ready at the wings who is much more pro-Russian. So I think his appetite is larger uh, than what Russia is doing at the moment. But I think they don't have the capabilities to do that at the moment. So that might be a longer term plan for him, but I don't think he's going to give it up as long he's in, as he is in power. Angela, it's always so helpful to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here. That's Angela Stent of the Brookings Institution. Coming up, we're going to go to talk about the new primaries that just came out yesterday in Ohio and Indiana with our Washington correspondent and host of Sound On. He is, of course, Joe Matthew. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The midterm election race got off to more or less of an official start yesterday with primaries in Indiana and Ohio. Here to give us an update on exactly where we stand two primaries in is Washington correspondent Joe Matthew. He is host of Sound on weekdays on Bloomberg Radio at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So, Joe, thanks for being here. I guess Ohio is the one we're really focused on. Yeah, we'll focus on Ohio. That was the one that got the most attention here and, in fact, had, David, the most expensive Senate primary in the country so far, and it ended up being a very good night, a win for J.D. Vance. That also means it was a good night for Donald Trump, who endorsed Vance pretty late in the Senate primary, lifting him from the middle back of the pack to front runner. And that's despite stiff competition from former state treasurer Josh Mandel, who was neck and neck with Vance in some polls. And he wrapped himself in all things Trump, even without getting an endorsement that he vied for which some thought might confuse voters. Even Donald Trump himself struggled with their names at a rally last weekend. Listen. So we've endorsed Dr. Oz. We've endorsed J.P., right? J.D. Mandel. And he's doing great. They're all doing good. <laughs> J.D. Mandel, he said, <laughs> combining their two names. It had prompted new campaign ads uh, uh, late in the process here, but they were for not. J.D. Vance won, David, by almost 10 points, which was a pretty remarkable turnout for someone who was a former never-Trumper and had never run for office before. He will face 10-term Congressman Tim Ryan in the race to replace outgoing Senator Rob Portman. And, it, David, it was a good night for Trump across the board. All 22 of his endorsed candidates in Ohio and Indiana won their races. I'm sure he's celebrating today, Joe. But as we look at this, we have two leading candidates outdoing one another to decide who's closer to Donald Trump to replace Rob Portman, who is a long That's way right. away from Donald Portman. What does this say about the general election? Uh, is it possible that the candidates might go too far, if I can use the expression right, to uh, elicit enough support to win the general? Well, it's a great question. You're right. Rob Portman kind of represents the last bastion of old Republican establishment, a moderate Republican here who helped to negotiate the infrastructure, now law, uh, with Democrats and with President Biden. So it's a little bit of a different look here. This pits a conservative populist in J.D. Vance against a moderate Democrat in Tim Ryan who likes yoga and uh, spent a lot of his time trying to appeal to blue-collar voters to peel away former Trump voters who might not have been too happy with the way 2020 worked out, David. This is going to be an interesting race to watch, and it will be a bellwether for the midterms. Yeah, really important race. Thank you so much to Joe Matthew, once again, host of Sound On every day of the week at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up, we're going to go to the White House with Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors with a recap of President Biden's remarks on inflation earlier today and a look forward to the Fed decision out just over an hour from right now. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The economy is front and center in Washington today, with President Biden coming out about 11 o'clock this morning to address questions particularly involving inflation. And now we have the Fed Reserve going to be issuing their decision in just about an hour and 10 minutes from right now. To bring us up to speed on all of this, we welcome back now Dr. Jared Bernstein of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. So, 
Dr. Bernstein, thank you so much for being with us. Let's start first with a recap of what President Biden had to say. He addressed several different things I heard, including some plans from Rick Scott, the senator from Florida. What was the central message for the president today? Well, first of all, let me just uh, give a shout out to the Army Band playing behind <laughs> me, making some, some beautiful noise. Uh, it's, they're not here just to play me in. They're, uh, they're here for an event. Uh, so this morning, the president talked about some of our key uh, economic issues. Obviously, whenever he talks about the economy, he elevates the challenge that inflation is posing to household budgets and what we as a White House are doing about that. Now, uh, today of all days, of course, the Federal Reserve is always signaled out as the first and foremost uh, uh, inflationary uh, fighting institution right now. But we're doing a ton, whether it's lowering gas prices through the release, uh, 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 an historically aggressive release of uh, barrels of oil from the Strategic Reserve, whether it's strengthening supply chains, whether it's helping to lower costs for families, whether it's health care premiums or prescription drugs. We're on to that as well. The president also mentioned some historic deficit reduction numbers, and that kind of negative fiscal impulse also helps ease inflationary pressures. Uh, so, so, Dr. Burstein, uh, I did listen to the president, and he laid out a lot of different things, but I'm curious about the fact that some of the things he's talking about re would require Congress to get involved. It would require legislation. What about things that are uniquely within the power of the administration? I, let me give you two or three. One is uh, uh, China tariffs. Uh, that's something you could take off right away and help the situation with inflation. What about the Jones Act? As I understand it, you can waive that for a period of time. There are various things like that that you could do, uh, even the Buy America plan, that could bring down inflation. What about those sorts of initiatives? These are all completely fair and germane questions, uh, but I uh, am part of a big team that works on all of them, and there's no readout on any of those right now. What I can tell you is that at the instruction of the president, everything is on the table. He wants to hear about any idea that will help ease inflationary pressures. Now, uh, we always have to look at the impacts of our policies. All of the things you mentioned have all kinds of follow-on and knock-on effects that we have to be aware of as well. But anything that might help ease inflationary pressures is on the table. Now, you talked about legislation. I do want to point out that one uh, thing that has been legislated is the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And that is also on the president's mind today, particularly as he uh, travels to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the future of electric vehicles. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Secretary Granholm in Michigan announcing $3 billion from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act in terms of expanding uh, EV charging capacity and making sure that fleet grows to the effect that we target our uh, electric vehicles as being half of vehicle sales by 2030. Jared, let me turn to the Fed for a moment, and I understand you don't control the Fed, but to that point, it's widely speculated the Fed is going to be tightening. We're going to hear it today at 2 o'clock this afternoon. It's going to be hearing it in subsequent meetings as well. What can the White House do to try to maximize the chance of what is called a soft landing? That is to say, a tightening that doesn't take us into recession. Well, first of all, uh, I think it's important to note, and I think it's actually one of the things the White House can do. Uh, you might think of this as forward guidance from the president. He has very consistently endorsed uh, the uh, Fed's pivot. Um, not every president is going to say that, but this president is out there saying uh, the Fed is the primary inflation fighter and they should do what they need to do to do so. Uh, obviously, he's put up a slate of uh, top-notch candidates, uh, nominees. Uh, we, we'd love to see them all confirmed as soon as possible. Then, while the Fed really works on the demand side of the economy, all the things I ticked off a few minutes ago, they're on the supply side. And while we can try to bring supply up to meet demand, I think that's what we can do in a complementary sense. Our work at the ports has brought down the dwell time, the amount of time, con con uh, contain that, the amount of time containers dwell uh, on the ports. I'm sorry, some, somebody is talking in my ear. Uh, if that's coming from, from Bloomberg, Bloomberg, please don't talk in Jared's ear. <laughs> he can do several yeah. things at once, but that's one too many. <laughs> I got enough going on in yeah. there. Yeah. Um, uh, so our work at the ports has brought down the dwell time at which containers uh, spend there, of course, moving to 24 and 7. Our work in the trucking has helped increase the supply of trucking. Goods are now getting to shelf uh, at pretty much the rate they were pre-pandemic. Of course, our work in energy markets, all of them are geared towards aligning supply and demand uh, more fulsomely right. from our right. uh, position. 
So it's a busy day for you, I know, and I really appreciate you taking the time. That's Dr. Jared Bernstein of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Coming up, we want to stay tuned to Bloomberg at 2 o'clock for that Fed decision, followed by the news conference. And this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.